Okay, what are we doing? Oh, there's actually people there. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, good. I wasn't expecting anybody to come. I thought I'd just be talking to Ivan. We can go his house in one All right. Forgive me if I uh, leave for a minute. I'm actually just recovering uh, from an overseas trip where I managed to catch Legionnaire's disease and another sort of pneumonia at the same time. I'm just about over it, but if I disappear with a coughing fit, uh, I'll be back in a minute or two. Okay. All right. Any questions to start off at all? Oh, I think Pete, a lot of people have started uh, striped marlin fishing and they've been catching a few lately and um, mainly just talking about all your lures and what's uh, what would you recommend for off Sydney? Well, as you know, Sydney Game Fishing Club is where I started. Just about everything that I do is based on my experiences out of Sydney. And then the Gold Coast, where, of course, there's a lot more marlin and you can prove theories pretty quickly. Um, there was a long period where in the Gold Coast, I fished every morning before work and I was back at work by 8.30, 9 o'clock, having caught three marlin. Uh, we do get the same striped marlin run that you get. Uh, we get a little earlier and then we actually get them coming back on the other way as well. And um, so there's been a lot of experience now with lures and striped marlin. Um, and, and it's quite different to what you guys actually do. But we, before we get into that, um, it's pretty historical that whenever I come out with a new product, um, Sydney Game Fishing Club is the first to hear about it and know about it. Um, I'm doing a lot more developing now because my stepson, Len, is back in the business. He's doing a really good job, which has given me lots of time to deal with the medical issues of an old man and do a whole bunch of developing. So that's pretty exciting stuff. So I'll just cross over to the new lures, which some people might have heard about. This lure is pretty much everything to do with lures all in one lure. It's actually keel weighted. So that's actually what the weighting is. It's got a lot denser on the bottom of the lure. The other thing too is that people sort of have a look at a lure and they go, I like that. You know, that's a good looking lure. Fish don't think like that. Fish actually don't, if they think, they think through their lateral lines, which is all about vibrations and pressure waves and stuff like that. And certainly the lateral line picks up everything to do with the boat and the lure long, long before we can actually see the lure. So the sonics and vibrations are really, really important. So with this lure, we've actually got jet holes of different sizes. So as the lure goes through the water, it's got cavities around the sides. The air goes through there, and there's actually three different sonics. So altogether, there's 12 of those jets, and plus those of, who can know about the fish print lures. They're also a very similar sort of jet head, uh, where the jets are larger in the front than they are at the back, which I call Venturi jets. It actually sits on the bottom of the lure which is much larger in the front than it is in the back. The other thing is my background is actually in the clothing trade. And many, many years ago, I worked for a company called Speedo. And for those of you who followed the Olympic swimmers, there was a thing called shark skin, a swimsuit called shark skin, which they used in the Olympics. Uh, Thorpe blitzed it, got a whole bunch of records. And I think within three years, they banned it. Now, shark skin is basically by having a rough surface on the outside. And that's what we've got with these lures. They're actually quite rough, which actually traps air bubbles and almost doubles uh, the vibration that goes out in the head. Also increases the, the bubble trail to some extent, but it does increase the vibration and keeps the vibration going longer for the whole time the lure is underwater. With most lures, they actually dive down with a huge bubble trail, then they run out of bubbles before they come back up to the surface. You all would have seen that. This will actually, and that means the vibrations are pretty much going as it's coming to the surface. The rougher skin makes sure that it continues to happen. But the problem with all these types of lures, like the Venturi jets and the, in the original fish prints, um, the sonics aren't really that loud. They go a long way. But to compound it and increase it, you really need to troll more than one 
of these sorts of lures, which is why we always recommended with the fish prints, troll a full pattern of them. Now, most of you in the game club won't do that because you've got your favorite lures, you're not going to change them. So you'll only ever troll one and maybe have a bit of success on it or not. But trolling five of them, the guys absolutely blitzed it. Probably not going to change you guys, but that's pretty much what the situation is. Once you've caught a couple of fish, you tend to not change. And even the lures are pretty much generational. The guys who started off with the original Pakula lures in the late, in the mid and late 80s, still use them. They won't change. Then the next guys who use the next lures, which were the um, powerheads, they still use those. They won't convert to the jets. And the jets are by far the best of all those sort of ranges because they're keeled and also have jets. But once you're locked into a type of lure, a brand of lure, it's, it's very rare for people to actually change. The Haley's Comets will be available in the fish prints and normal colours. And so far, the results have been pretty good. Very happy with the way people have uh, reported running them. So they're in the range and they'll keep going. Are there any questions about that? The smallest Haley's Comet, what size? Uh, right down to the 15s, which is six and a half inches long. Okay. And, you know, you're talking about Sydney Marlin. I didn't use lures that big for striped Marlin. Now, those of you who remember me from Sydney Game Fishing Club, I'm pretty, mu I'm pretty much a light tackle guy. I like eight kilo, eight kilo tackle. And these size lures and smaller with light gauge hooks, absolutely blitzes them up, the striped marlin. They don't come up and play with them, they just eat them. In fact, I use lures as small as Uzis for striped marlin, and I find them by far the most successful. But they're difficult to run on heavier tackle. So they're really a light tackle lure. And my biggest striped on one of these is about 125 kilos or eight kilo tackle. Okay, so the smaller the lure, the more a striped marlin is just going to eat it. Okay, but there's a lot more to lure size and, and stuff like that. We'll, we'll sort of get into it, I guess. You sound like you, you believe that a lot of people will stick with lures that they've had success on, but when you're fishing, you mix it up and you're using different lures all the time, Peter? Do I use different lures all the time? Yeah. I, I use the latest range that I've made. But I use them in full patterns. I don't mix ranges of lures. I think it's a really big mistake because I think it confuses the sonics. Now, there's a, a really good case um, by other lure makers who only run their own lures in patterns as well. Um, everybody's heard of Marlon Parker? Yeah? Do I get a yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Marlon Parker fished on a boat. Uh, in the US, five I think it was four years in a row for the multi-million dollar tournaments and won all four of them. I went to the HRBT in 1996. It was the first time I was allowed to run my own lures in a full pattern and we won the tournament. And there's lots and lots of experiences like that. Don't mix ranges of lures. Don't mix brands of lures. Run the proper patterns that the lure maker you choose tells you to run. Okay. We get so many reports, it is ridiculous. I probably get five or six reports a day of guys success and guys failure. Okay. So we can really add up and summarize really what works and what doesn't work. Okay. What line classes are guys using for stripes in Sydney club? Probably 15 kilo. 15, 24. Bit heavy for stripes, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I actually think that eight and 10 kilos is the best line class for stripes because you can use smaller lures and stuff. Using how smaller lures. Take to bring him in. Very fun. Depending on how long you want to take bringing him in, but. Uh, the stripe island that we were getting off the Gold Coast towards the end when we were learning a lot. Uh, about a 70 kilo striped on eight was 25, 30 minutes. Okay. 
it's all about basically boat handling drag scales like for example um on eight kilo gear um i go up to about six and a half seven kilo a drag which is more than you guys are using on 15 kilo okay most of you use five kilo on 15 is that right yep okay at, at five kilos you're getting most of the stretch out of the line but the line's still laying along the side of the fish during the fight you're not pulling it tight once you get up to about 50 percent drag you're pulling the line tight and you're actually putting pressure sideways on the fish rather than trying to pull it backwards okay so on on six or seven kilo and eight kilo line let's say six um you're actually putting more pressure on the fish than you are on 15 on five kilo okay because you're actually dictating to the fish um the other thing is that the strike drags you know i use three and a half kilo and eight kilo gear for strike light gauge hooks and the hookup rates pretty spectacular if you do one other thing um are most of you familiar with trout in rivers or had a fish tank or actually watch fish in a current you'll find that they're always facing into the current and they're always swimming into the current because that's what fish are designed to do it's easier for them if you if a fish swims down current you'll see that he burns a lot more energy now some people don't believe that the current makes any difference on the ocean but it's just the running river the fish know where they are they come back to the same places to breed every year so they know where they are in the currents but they do face into the current and even with marlin they're designed to basically glide they're, they're actually not strong swimmers most of the time this is quite an amazing photo you can sort of see how long the peck fins are peck fins on fish that big are not designed to move quickly all the time they're basically gliders in the in the currents and to glide in the current they've got to face into the current if they glide down current they actually have to move their tails like an aeroplane going into the wind and going downwind going into the wind they can control what they're doing going downwind they've got to use a lot more power okay so when you're trolling lures and you want an aggressive strike you don't troll into the current because if you're trolling into the current the fish actually swims up behind the lure grabs the lure and keeps going forward towards the boat and if you watch your rod tips when this is happening and you can see the striped marlin coming up behind your lure and doing all that wavy stuff when he hooks up you'll actually see your rod straighten up then bend as it turns by going down current you'll actually notice that the fish are much more aggressive they don't screw around with it and they just eat the lures the difficulty is that most people start off trolling baits either live baits or dead baits and they get used to trolling into the current trying to get a skipper who's used to that to troll down current is incredibly difficult okay but it makes all the difference for example most of the boats on the in the gold coast um go out a bit and then they pretty much troll north straight into the current during a bunch of tournaments you can see all the trophies behind me i'd actually steam north about 15 miles and then zigzag back down the current and one of the classics is um the tournament that my wife jay fished in in a three-day tournament we only fished for six hours we got seven marlin uh, trolling down current and the tournament total was 14 for three days and we didn't fish the other two days and only fished half a day it's incredibly effective but there is a secret to it we're fishing the east coast east coast current of australia and everybody thinks oh, it's going north and south so i'll just troll south or zigzag south most of the fish are actually in the eddies spinning off the east australian current so the current can be going in any direction so what we do is every hour or so i do a big circle in the boat and notice what speeds we're doing if we're going at the fastest speed we're going down current the slower speeds going into the current so that gives me an idea of the direction of the current and interestingly enough off the gold coast uh, where we sort of develop this system most of the time when there's lots of fish the currents are actually going from northeast to southwest and if you have a look at the eddies that means an eddy's spinning in 
and we're actually fishing the leading edge of it. And the leading edge of, a, of an eddy holds 90% of the biomass of the eddy. Okay. Of course, we use helpful things like rip charts to have an idea of where the eddies are. It's very difficult to pinpoint stuff when you actually go out there with rip charts, but it gives you a good idea of what's going on. Okay. Now, because we use smaller lures, I also recommend taglines, but most of the tagline returns that you you get with uh, outriggers are just too heavy. You can't troll small lures off them. So we actually make um, a tagline return kit that is a lot lighter, and we've got all the stoppers and stuff in it as well, plus the instructions of setting it up. And the important thing about using taglines is that the release of the rubber band, or, or you can use clips if you want, but that's a bit dangerous, but the release of the rubber band should equal your strike drag. So you've got to find rubber bands that will actually break at that breaking strength. The other thing too is that we realised that the way we were testing rubber bands to find out their breaking strain was wrong. We used to get a set of scales, put the rubber band around a cleat, break it, and that would be the kilos. But it's quite different to actually, actually put the rubber band on the line and then break it. You'll find that it's actually a little bit weaker. The other thing now is that a lot of the rubber bands are made out of synthetics. We used to use a size 18 rubber band for trolling eight kilo on taglines, but there are now size 18 rubber bands out there that don't break at three kilos, they break at 11 kilos, which you can imagine is not much good on eight kilo line. So you do have to check your rubber bands, probably buy a few brands, find one you like, and don't pull out all of them out of the packet because they'll disintegrate in the sun and the salt. So just pull out a few that you're going to use through the day and use those and keep the box intact in a airtight plastic bag or a Ziploc. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. The other thing that people get a bit wrong with, with striped marlin in particular is I'll ask you a question. What speed do you troll at? Somebody tell me, give me a figure. Six and a half to seven and a half. Okay, that's the, the speed we developed. But in a way, once you get experience, that's misleading. Because that's the speed of the boat. And that's great if the weather's calm. But what we're more interested in, we're trolling lures. So it's the speed of the lures that make more difference. For example, if your boat's doing six and a half knot and it's mirror calm, then your lures are doing six and a half knots. But if you're getting into a choppy northwesterly where the waves have got no backs on them, the lures are screaming down the face of these waves. They're doing a lot more than six and a half knots. So you really want to have a look at what your lures are doing when it's calm and get them to do that when it's choppy and rough. Because what happens is that if you're fishing choppy conditions at six and a half knots, although the lures may look great, once you get above seven and a half knots, the rigs and lures aren't all that stable, so it's very hard to keep a hook point up. Okay, and that's quite a critical thing. So have a look at, rather than trolling speed, try and work out what your lure speed should look like and adjust your speed to that. Okay, that that makes a huge difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, if you've got a following sea, for example, you know, when you're running down the... Uh, so you're going to vary your speed from anywhere from 10 knots down to six knots when you're in the valley, when you're in the um, top of the way. So, so how do you adjust for that? So what would be your solution to that? What was that, Pete? Sorry? What's your solution for that problem? Well, you try and go across the current, across the lake more so than down, but uh, sometimes you can't. Well, if you can't, you can't. But that, you know what you said is right. You try and go across the sea rather than down the face of bloody big swells. Okay, and then you should put out lures that will cope with that, which is basically a shorter head um, and a rounder head. You know, that's a mouse. That's a shorter head. That'll work in choppy conditions, but the lure that will work the best is our hornet and shaker that's actually got a rounded edge on it. And that will dig in a lot harder and stay in a lot better. Okay. 
longer heads like the sprockets and stuff like that they're really for normal conditions so really you, you need a few sets of lures with different heads on them most people won't fish rough conditions most people actually call it quits when it's about 15 to 18 knots okay i know you know in your situation ron where you're on charter boats and stuff you're fishing every piece of shit there is and certainly in my time in sydney we fished just about every weekend for three or four years in a row and we fished some absolute crap i actually fished in the worst storm that and seas that sydney had had almost in its history we actually left uh, broken bay during a tournament where they said it was fishable we went out the heads and the sea was absolutely enormous to the point where i couldn't turn around it ended up having to go to sydney and i think the swells were about six to eight meters and that was pretty scary and the lures were basically screaming down the face of the wave they looked pretty spectacular in those days though that was the era of my beer barrels which are quite rounded heads and was pretty exciting and when we got back in through the heads my steering cable broke and I passed out from exhaustion <laughs> but that was rough okay apart from that you know the other system with the striped marlin is basically as with every other fish is try and pull it down current and it'll stay up on the surface of blue marlin won't dive and it won't die if you can pull it down current they'll stay on the surface if you go up current of them they will dive down and quite often die okay does that make sense okay so that's pretty much it, it, it about striped marlin you know the once you get used to them they're not that hard to catch you know basically the most marlin I've caught off the Gold Coast and eight kilo most most stripes they're averaging about I guess 60 to 75 kilos we got 11 in a day out of 11 shots on the smaller lures okay um, Peter what type of teasers setup do you like to run with if, if you do at all which type one I think I think teasers are incredibly critical for for just about everything including striped marlin that they, they really react well to teasers which doctors the teaser witch doctors um they're easy to use they stay below the surface they work um a lot of people don't troll them far enough back and we've found now that if we put the fish strips on the tow rope of the witch doctor um they're actually more effective and we're selling heaps of them to the point where we will actually be going back into production of them sometime this year uh, at home we're putting up another shed so we can <clears throat> get enough production out we actually had a bunch of hippies delivered a couple of weeks ago and we sold out um, yesterday of hippies so it's pretty hard to keep up with them <clears throat> the other thing that I will do if I've got the crew is I will run a surface teaser um like a flippy floppy for which we're the distributors in Australia uh, and on smaller boats we'll actually troll daisy chains and we've actually just developed um these daisy chains somebody should get a prize for knowing what the name of this color is all right and on the same sort of thing as the uh other jets we're doing these are actually what I call venturi jets larger on the inside on the outside and then tapering to quite a small jet on the uh, on the back of the lure and these are actually made up we actually call these daisy squids and they've actually got the head on them and a bunch of guys now are using these heads on skip baits and swimming baits especially from Macron and they're absolutely blitzing it so we sell those too they're quite open on the inside and we've actually got these inserts that slide up the, the squid to make it a lot stronger than a normal squid that actually pulls down in, in a lot of daisy chains so we've actually reinforced them um I'll try troll something like that on top of the witch doctor but not further back than the witch doctor I'll keep it closer than the witch doctor so that fish actually don't get locked onto it the problem with a lot of teasers like spreader bars um and dredges is a lot of fish will come up to them attack them and won't switch off them to a lure or a bait 
they basically might give up after a while and then they actually swim away. So I don't particularly like using dredges, uh, trolling lures, um, and not really even spreader bars, although a lot of people do use them with success. Uh, I prefer the witch doctor with the fish with the strips on them and maybe a daisy chain over the top of it, but shorter. We actually troll the witch doctor a, a fair bit further back than most people do. We move the short corner to the same wave as the long corner and we troll the witch doctor where the short corner would normally be. So we've actually got the short and long corner on the same waves. Okay. And that's that's incredibly effective and a lot of people are finding that out now. And even in the giant bluefin fishery, uh, we're actually selling a lot of witch doctors now to the US uh, for the giant bluefin, Norway and Ireland, where they've got the bluefin fisheries now. Yeah, I've got another question. Um, Pam, the, what, what do you prefer to hook uh, rig or the single hook rig? I think the days of the twin hook rigs, like the shackle rig, are, are really over. Um, we, we used to sell heaps of them. In fact, we sold thousands of them. But now this keel rig has taken over. I mean, it's called the swivel rig, actually. And that's basically a loose hook on a loose loop and a swivel. Okay. And we sell now, oh, geez. I actually think the last time we sold the shackle rig and it was just one was about three months ago. And these are people who used to use the shackle rigs. Um, so it's been quite a remarkable change that um, we've still got lots of stock of shackle rigs. We can actually supply thousands of them. But, you know, basically all the orders are now for the swivel rigs. And the reason that basically both rigs, the swivel rig and the shackle rig, are based on the same sort of idea, that when you're looking at your rod tip, you'll notice that the lures will basically bend your rod, straighten up, bend your rod, straighten up, because the lures accelerate and decelerate while you're going through the water. And what the hook basically wants to do is it'll go bend down when it slows down, and then it'll straighten up again. Bend down, straighten up. And if it's not allowed to do that and you stiff rig it, then when it wants to do that, It'll just fold over to the side. And there's some guys who have fished in the north uh, recently um, using what is essentially stiff rigs. And you can uh, basically, they're single hook stiff rigs. And you can see by the hookup rates that the hook is quite shallow and it's just going a very short distance below the jawline. It's not going around the jaw and they're not even penetrating on 130. So really, you want a hook that's going to stay point up and be big enough to go around the actual jawbone of the fish you're targeting. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The other thing too is that you know that I can understand why some people will get a hook and basically have a, a size where it just goes around the lower head. And some people are actually using smaller hooks. And the reason that they're using smaller hooks is that they're running generally sliced headed lures. And if they use big hooks, when it rolls over to the side, it actually stops the lure working properly and the hookup rates crap. By using smaller hooks, the lure can actually tell the hook what to do. Because these really are very large keels. And the lure will basically do whatever the, the, a large hook tells it to. By using a smaller hook, then the lure basically will run smoother and they're using hook locks too, so the point will run up. But the problem is that they're not getting a deep enough bite into the fish's jaw to get a secure hookup. So they miss a bunch of strikes, they get a lot of fish jumping off. But the real best thing to do is actually use a, a hook one size up than the diameter of the lure head. Okay? So that's a good size. It's basically one size up. For that makes sense and by using the swivel rig because it's got the swivel the lure can do what it's designed to do because it can rotate and wobble and all that sort of stuff and the hook can remain point up and that's incredibly important 
Remember, it's this that catches the fish, not the lure, not anything else. It's the hook. So getting the hook point to remain up is absolutely critical. Okay. All right. What do you want to hear about next? Are those venturi heads printed? Yes, they are. You, you could mould them, but they'd cost an absolute fortune. You'd get an awful lot of failures and the moulds wouldn't last very long. So we 3D print those. And the other thing about the 3D printing is that we're able to kill the lures by air. So basically the bottom half of the lure is a very heavy uh, solid print and the top of the lure that there's a lot of air pockets in that part of the lure, which kills the lure a lot more than lead does. Um, lead's only 11 times heavier than water and air is a thousand times lighter. So air killing is incredibly effective. So 3D printing allows you to do that. To do that in a mold would be incredibly difficult. Thanks. And, and really what the head of a lure looks like it is so irrelevant. You know, everybody goes on about the craftsmanship in a lure. That's really good. But as a fishing tool, it's certainly relevant because the head's covered in bubbles most of the time. And what we've noticed, even with the fish prints, we designed these so that basically the fish would strike further down and not strike the lure head. We've been making these now since uh, the 3D printed ones was 2014. So we've been making them now for about 10 years, nine years. And we've only had two heads that have been damaged because of what they said was fish. Okay. So they're quite resilient. And the, because there's nothing too fancy in the head, they're actually striking lower down in the skirts. They're not, they're not striking the heads. And that's an incredibly important part about um, what we do as a development because the hook's not in the head, it's further down. In fact, we actually run the hooks um, as far down as is legal. So we actually run the hooks with just the eye in the skirt. That's actually illegal for GFAA. So that's probably better for that, or that wouldn't be banned. So we actually push the limits of the uh, the rules because somebody knew what they were talking about a long time ago. And we don't know why, but it's been incredibly effective. And by having the hook that far back, no matter where the fish strikes the lure, the hook is always coming at it. Whereas if you have the hook higher up, if it bites the tail, then you've missed the hook up. So wherever uh, the fish strikes by having the hook that far down, you've got a really good chance of hooking the fish. Okay. But how long do you think you've got to hook a fish? How much time have you got to actually hook a fish from the time it strikes? This is really interesting. Oh. Everyone's very quiet, Pete. They're listening to you. But yeah. I've had fish follow the boat for a long time. Oh, no, once they strike it. Sorry? Once they actually grab the lure or the hook, how much time have you got to get that barb through the fish's jaw? Can, oh, but as you're aware, sometimes uh, some people have different techniques where they free spool the lure and let the fish run off with it in their mouth and then slowly increase the drag. So you actually have a bit of time. No, their hookup rate is crap. Yeah, true, it is. But yeah. oh, it sometimes works well. No, it doesn't. It actually doesn't. You've actually got one yeah. You've actually got one twenty-fifth of a second to hook that fish. Yeah. It hooks itself, but yeah, it's self-hooking. Yeah. Very rarely people go, shit, at the moment, oh, he's on the bait, he's on the water. You know, by the time you get to the rod either, it's on. It, it can only hook itself if you've got enough drag or pressure to get that hook through the fish's jaw. Right. Right. And a lot of people don't do that. They basically have drags that are way too light, they don't get the barb in, fish does its first run, jump, shakes its head, hooks, hooks fall out. If you can set that hook in a 25th of a second, which is by using at least one third the drag of uh, one third of the line class at strike. And what I don't understand is every real manufacturer has got the button and what's written next to it. <laughs> strike. 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 Every game real manufacturer who never agrees on anything agrees on what strike is. 
every single one of them. Penn, Shimano, Penn, Shimano Makaras, Polakanskis, all of them. Abbots, they all have that button called strike. Now, what do people do? Go up to strike and back it off to hook a fish. Only the people who don't get many fish. Everyone? The people who don't get many fish. Well, most that. people don't get many fish. That's why it's easy to win tournaments. A lot, a lot of people overseas free school strike and harm, believe it or not, with lures on it. And then, then gently put the drag up. That's why they lose really weird ideas. I've never got weird ideas. All right, basically, we, we gave Bill Pino, who's the Squid Nation guy and my distributor in the US, I gave him a set of instructions. And he fishes on many, many different boats. It took him a year to get on a boat that would follow those instructions, a year. And fishing in, in the Dominican Republic, he finally followed the instructions and went 999 on Blue Marlin. And he'd never done that before in 30 years of fishing, nor had anybody else on the boat. Okay, you can have a great hookup rate if you follow the instructions. But you've got to follow all of the instructions because it's joining the dots. You leave one of those dots out, the system fails. Okay. And the system's actually on um, my website. I'll try and find it. I forget where it is. I think it's called Increase Hookup Rates. It's on pakula.com. Have a look at those instructions, follow those instructions, and your success rate will definitely increase. You can argue all you want, but the statistics are there. It's not a matter of what you think about. It's not a matter of what you like. It's not a matter of what you uh, think is right or not. The statistics don't lie. Okay? There's a lot of pride in game fishing, and people won't change. They won't take any notice of it. They'll just keep on doing what they're doing and failing. And they are just too proud to change, okay? Because of all the reports we get, we we get a lot of novice fishermen and they're the ones we tell what to do and their success rate is phenomenal. We don't advertise it because we like to keep their privacy so that they don't uh, cop a flogging on social media, but the success rate is phenomenal, okay? So try the things we've spoken about and you will be successful. Smaller lures for stripes. Watch your trolling speed. Don't troll into the current, zigzag down current. Of course, if you're in rough conditions, you've got to do what the seas dictate to you. But then again, still try and look at what the lure speed actually is rather than your trolling speed. That's really important. It makes a lot of difference. The most important thing when you're out there trolling is not really what the lures are doing, it's what the rigs are doing because that's what you're hooking your fish on. You really want to keep that hook point up, okay? And if you do that, you can't go wrong. I mean, I can talk for four hours and make everything a lot more complicated, but it's not that complicated, okay? And I think that's almost about it for tonight. One more. Um I know we've been talking about strike mum, but I want to um, ask you about yellowfin or tuna, yellowfin bluefin, because I know you, uh, your lures have had some great success there. But do you have a particular favourite uh, lure or pattern that you like to run um, with the tuna? I mean, we've had some great tuna seasons down here, and we run a tuna slam, so I think a few people like to hear your thoughts on tuna. Tuna are really quite easy if they're there. Um, if they're not there, they're really hard. So you've really got to find out where they are. They're, they're pretty um, they're pretty easy to catch if they're there. I went down and fished um, Portland, at, I think, four years in a row. In the last three years, on the Friday night dinner before we fished the weekend, I told the guys what Lou would catch the fish on. And three years in a row, including winning the tournament down there, it was on the lures that I told them that it would be on. Once again, the lures were smaller than they normally use because the bait's quite small. But I tend to use much smaller lures than most people for the species. Like, for example, um, for all the tuna species, like yellowfin and uh, southern bluefin, eight and a half inch lures are the biggest lures I'll use. And certainly, 
to six and a half and seven inch if the conditions allow and generally tuna, tuna seasons are pretty rough by the nature of them um i use the eight and a half inch lures uh, the colors are always the same i don't change colors uh, i'll change the specific color <coughs> but it's always black on the short corner it's always blue and silver maybe over pink on the long corner it's always purple or violet on the uh, short rigger and this is our new stripy color which is outdating the old stripy color and it's been doing incredibly well uh, all the new skirts are much better than the old skirts um the old skirts used to get pretty sticky the new skirts don't uh, then on the long rigger um i use grasshopper it's a bit hard to believe but it's actually better than lumo okay but hopefully we still sell lumo because we've got lots and lots of skirts and that's called grasshopper um, and on the shotgun of course everybody knows now brad j is the color for the shotgun those colors really never change the shotgun might but the other colors you know might be other black combinations might be other violet purple combinations but it's always black blue violet uh green and then at the moment the hot favorites brad j but it can it can change the only time I, I would change that is if i'm fishing on a boat and this happens you get on a boat and you you go okay pete you can have uh one right out there and put the lure you want on it in which case i go for a slightly larger lure and it's always black and if i can get the shotgun uh, with a black lure that becomes a bit of a blocker and you'll get a lot more fish than everybody else will uh, there was a couple of years on a boat called JR that I fished on where I was fishing with Chris Hall and the other guys absolutely cracked the, the poos about Chris and I getting every shot and then they said oh we want to change positions and we said okay so we changed positions but we already knew about blocker lures and we just put out another lure that would block theirs and we still got most of the shots or all of the shots I think uh no most of the shots so if you it's very different if you're running your own full pattern or if you're just trolling one lure in a spread with mates other lures as well okay so always go for black and always get it out as far back in the pattern as you can and you'll do incredibly well okay in those days we didn't know that the black was that good we used to use blue and silver in fact it was before I made lures those lures were striker sh3 color 47 and we caught a lot of fish on but what was interesting in the old days is lures that were hot one year weren't hot again the next year and it was actually Pakula lures were the first to break that where the actual green and yellow beer barrel actually kept working for years on end the Lumos rocket has been working for near on 40 years uh, the evil sprocket's been working for about the same time so um we do the best we can with lures we work on all the statistics and reports that we get and we adjust accordingly which is why colors change subtly and why we bring out new lures once the information comes out okay the fish print heads the 3d ones with the venturi jets have been unbelievably successful um if you run the full pattern uh, we realize that lots of people don't run a full pattern we want to get the same sonics out there which is why we're now doing the Haley's comet because that really should result in, in a, a good success rate uh, it'll keep getting tweaked for a couple of years with uh, different weight things and that's what happens to our ranges uh, the sprocket is probably now in its 14th version uh, we change them subtly so that the customers don't get upset but for example the I don't know if many people have noticed um, but the old small sprocket and the new small sprocket if I can find one that's the original small sprocket that's the power and you can see it's actually about 10 to 12 percent bigger and it's been growing every year by about one percent so that the customers don't notice the change but we found that the larger size uh, was far more effective for blue marlin and big blacks and the smaller size and it carried the rig better and was a lot more stable and our skirts have actually increased in length over the years as well uh, to increase stability so we don't rest on our laurels and we try and give you the best 
uh, results that we can. We still sell a lot of um, patterns. Uh, so if you want a full pattern, we can do that. Um, we're also using those daisy squid in spreader bars, uh, which have been quite effective. And we do put hooks in the spreader bars and on daisy chains, which is illegal. And it's about time that rule was changed. Um, the reason the rule came in in the first place is because I was actually fishing with Ivan on Constance many, many years ago uh, with a hooked daisy chain. And I think we caught too many striped marlin. It wasn't a lot of striped marlin, but it pissed off one of the IGF guy, uh, GFAA guys and he brought in the rule to ban uh, birds and daisy chains, which is a bit annoying. So they can really change that rule back. The other thing we're doing is the older skirts now um, with the UV and stuff, uh, we're actually um, making those in cheapy. So they're absolutely dirt cheap. And that's these lures. We're doing them in all the colors and stuff. They're a 3D printed uh, Venturi Jet cockroach head. And you can find them in some of the tackle shops uh, or online where you can pick the colors and stuff as well. As a rule, uh, just to get back to the yellow fin, my, my dream, and I'm sure a lot of other people's, is to catch a giant blue marlin. It'd be nice to catch a thousand pounder, wouldn't it? And that's what that's what's with those large schools of yellowfin. In Fiji, many years ago, when I did schools there in the in the early nineties, we would take the boat out on the weekends when the crew had gone home and before the next lot came, and we would go down to Cape Washington. And we would fish for yellowfin, which are around about 35 kilos. And just for fun, we'd live bait them. And the longest alive 35 kilo yellowfin lasted was about 50 seconds. A giant blue would eat it. We only had stand up 80s. We had no chance of ever catching one. But we probably did that five weeks in our own hook giant blue marlin every time we could catch a yellowfin and put it straight down. The hard thing was you had to keep that yellowfin in the school of yellowfin. There was no point catching the yellowfin, mucking around, fighting it, and then the school moving off and you're dropping it in. You had to move it in there. And what was really interesting is that the sharks didn't attack the yellowfin when we used them for bait. But as soon as we put a, stri a striped tuna down there, the sharks nailed it, which was really interesting. So as far as yellowfin go off uh, the east coast of Australia, Regardless of the size, I'd be putting a hook to its nose and putting it straight back down there. If nothing eats it, you've still got a fresh yellowfin tuna to take home, but if something eats it, you're in for the fight of your life. Okay. Only did it twice on the Gold Coast, and both times we hooked a monster, Blue Marlin. Uh, we didn't get any of them. Uh, we got a third one next to the boat on a lure. Interestingly enough, it was actually on a medium sprocket. It was actually on an evil medium sprocket that. Uh, Chris Hawthorne was on the boat, had been in cancer previous week, and he's, there's a very famous photo taken by Paul B. Kidd with a guy about to tag about a 1,200-pound uh, black marlin, uh, which Paul B. Kidd took many years ago. Spectacular photo. And Chris Hawthorne was the guy holding the tag pole, and it was the following week we hooked the monster, and Chris said this was much bigger. Once again, we had no chance of landing it. Um, the fourth big blue we got, we actually got to the boat, but the decky... It was the only experienced guy on board, leading it, got hit in the head by the bill and got knocked out. So we had it tied off to the side of the boat. It wasn't a good idea. It was just ripping the side out of the black watch. <laughs> so we cut it loose. But what was interesting is that even using the large live yellowfin um, off the Gold Coast, the big blue marlin were with the schools. So get a yellowfin and put a hook through it and put it down alive on a 130 and hang on. Okay, you just free spool it. For a count of 60 and then lock up and see what you've hooked and if it's nothing at least you've still got your yellow fin and you're rigging it the how are we rigging it okay. yeah yeah uh, just hook straight through the nose and not right no yeah no just hook straight through the nose you can bridle them if you want but we wanted to get them straight back down in the school we didn't want to muck around so it's basically we were actually using cord lines to get the yellowfin, so we ripped them straight in, hooked straight through the nose, straight back into the school, because that's where the blues are. The blues are with the school. They're not behind the schools. They're not 
They're not in front of the schools, they're in the schools, they're just below the schools. Okay. So we didn't want to waste time holding it upside down, mucking around with a bridle of any sort. This was, you know, they're, they're too big to use rubber bands on, so you're using cord, got to get the needle through it. Yellowfin's not exactly holding still for you to do that. Even when they're upside down, they're big to hang on to. So it was a pretty quick thing. And we actually put the hook through the nose before we took the lure out of the fish. Okay. And yeah, two guys got hooked, but that was part of it. At least the barbs didn't go in, but they got scared. Okay. And then put up a cooler in it when you hang it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing how often that happens by other guys. Anyway, um, I think that's really about it. Most of you would know all the stuff I talk about. I don't want to get too repetitive about it. Have you learned anything new tonight? Yes, Pedro. Okay. All right. Any more questions? No, I think you've done a great job, Pete. All right. One, one thing, though. Once you hook up, once you, I actually had a lot of arguments about this and actually ended up with Pam Basco in IGFA in those days um, telling us what the rule meant, which is the angler must get to the rod as soon as possible. Now, as soon as the fish takes off with the with the lure or the bait, start fighting the fish. The guy who's the angler <clears throat> should not pull in any, any other lines before then. And the skipper really should um, just turn the boat down, sea, uh, down current for a short period until things settle down. Don't go pulling, don't go pulling in all the gear before somebody gets to the rod. You'll end up losing a bunch of fish and you lose control. The fish gets too much line out. Um, and it's just not really a, a manner for success. And for example, on my boat, the animal, in fact, all of my boats for the last four or five boats, once we hooked up, we actually didn't pull the gear in at all until the fish settled down. We left all the gear out there. And the reason was that, you know, we were getting pretty used to catching marlin and the buzz was getting a double or a triple or quadruple hookup on marlin, including blues, black stripes. And by keeping the gear out there, um, you'd be amazed at how often a drifting lure, when you slow down, actually will catch a fish. Because that's where all the fish are. You're in the spot. You might as well get as many of them as you can. Okay. When you're brim fishing with three or four rods, when you hook a brim, on one of the rods, you don't pull in all the other ones first, do you? These fish settle down pretty quickly. You don't have to worry about it. The, a blue marlin will go ballistic for about 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds, and then it'll settle down. So whether you pull in the gear or not, it isn't going to make any difference at that stage. But the idea is trying to hook as many fish as you can and fighting them. Okay? Does that make sense? Yep. It's hard to do. <clears throat> It's hard to do because you're used to yelling out, get the gear in, get the gear in, get all that sort of stuff in. The other thing too, in a bunch of videos, the guys get the gear in in the wrong order. I'm pretty sure you guys wouldn't be doing this. But when you're putting gear out, you put the furthest thing out first, like the shotgun, and then work your way closer to the boat. But when you're pulling the gear in, you pull in the gear closest to the boat first, working your way out to the shotgun. The shotgun comes in last. Okay, it's pretty important that you do that so you don't get tangled. The other thing that I've noticed is... Um, the guys are really leaving too much crap on the deck. The deck should be clear once the guy's fighting fish. It shouldn't have hooks on it, lures, daisy chains and stuff for people to trip over. It's very important. Um, is Sydney Game Fishing Club um, allowing solo anglers? No. No? Okay. We don't, but it's becoming very common down south and they're encouraging it. Yeah, I actually started it many years ago in the cockroach. Really, really important that if you're going solo fishing, that you've got another boat with you. Like I was solo fishing uh, in the cockroach, but I was always with another boat for safety. Okay. The other thing too is if you're fishing solo without another boat next to you, and I mean within 150 yards, um, you should be wearing a life jacket and you should have a personal e -perv. I don't know if you guys heard about the solo angler who uh, fell over the side of his boat while he was fighting a fish and they found his boat, but they didn't find him. That That's just a really sad occurrence. The other thing too is that <clears throat> having a look at new boats and trailer boats and stuff that are supposed to be fishing boats, 
they don't have any toe holds in them. They've done away with the side pockets where you can actually put your toes under there and sort of hang on. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, if you don't understand, ask Ron. Um, because that's a really important thing to have stability. Without the toe holds, it's really easy to slip out of the boat, even when you're taking a piss. In fact, most of the people that uh, drown at sea on boats um, and get lost over the side um, on boats and fishing boats are actually having a piss. That's the most dangerous thing you can do. So basically, piss in a bucket in the corner of the boat. Don't hang over the side unless you've got a tow hole. All right? And if you're fishing solo, wear a life jacket and a personal EPIRB. They're not that uncomfortable, especially in Sydney weather that's a lot cooler than where I am. Okay. All right, I think that'll do. Roll the raffle. I said thank you very much, Peter. All right. Thank you. All the best. Thank you very much, Pete. We'll see you soon. I hope so. All the best, guys. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Bye.